I think that I suggested at the first service and then to dawn as we concluded our week of Bible school that next week, or excuse me, next year and maybe in the years to come, we should go ahead and not only purchase one shirt, but maybe two. Uh, first shirt as far as an advertisement of Vacation Bible School in advance, and then the second shirt that I survived Vacation Bible School would be, a, uh, would be appropriate. That would be the one that we would throw out to the volunteers that I survived VBS. So grateful this week uh, for all of your participation. So thankful for so many of you who uh, brought your, your, uh, your family and uh, your grandchildren and many of you uh, brought your neighbors and, and your van loads of students from your neighborhood. I especially want to extend a word of appreciation uh, to Kristen and certainly to Dawn as she uh, did a, just a stellar job of coordinating and leading to Erica Bickard as well uh, and uh, grateful for Erica. She was a champ for her first VBS on staff and then Uh, I want to just mention, too, some of the the behind-the-scenes folks that Bible school doesn't happen without Kelly Taylor in the church office and Brenda Bickhart, and so thankful for their participation as a support staff for all that we would do. And then, listen, Terry Buckner comes in after hours and cleans up after everything, and uh, can't, yeah, look, man, it... uh, it's been a, a terrific, terrific week, and so I just am so thankful for uh, all who participate, and uh, the list could just go on and go, go on and go on. Uh, one thing I just want to mention to you, uh, and this is kind of on the shh, but before you go this morning, before you go this morning, I want you to go ahead and duck your face inside the nursery and tell Bonnie, who's our nursery coordinator, it's her birthday today. So uh, just tell her happy birthday before you leave this morning at Sharptown Church. <clears throat> she, uh, again, behind the scenes in ministry. So we've been thinking together, and we've been working our way through during our summer months. Uh, we started in Easter and started collecting some questions that have to do with faith, questions that have to do with theology, some have to do really with the church, and uh, we're trying to put them together in some semblance of order. And so let me just say to you that this morning uh, we're going to begin for the next two weeks to look at the exact same passage of Scripture, but with a completely different dynamic next Sunday as we look at this Sunday. I want to begin uh, for the next couple of minutes as quickly as I can, just to offer a recap of last Sunday because it's important uh, for us to consider. And I want to do that this morning with a four-line little poem uh, that I'd like for you to read with me, uh, nice and loud, enthusiastic, like you really mean it. Here we go. Uh, Grandpa dropped his glasses in a pail of purple dye, and when he put them on again, he saw a purple sky. And you're thinking, Doug, that's really ridiculous. And, and it is, but serves to uh, make a point this morning that last Sunday uh, we handed out these glasses and we invited you to go ahead and place them on. Uh, now, the funny thing was that after second service, some of you folded them this way and you had them on the opposite of the person seated next to you. But it really served to go ahead and illustrate for us that it makes a difference what lens you are looking at your life with, what lens you are looking at your life with, and so we invited you to cover your eye and look through the red lens, and then to cover your eye and look through the blue lens, and then for grandpa, obviously it's the purple lens, it makes a difference what lens you look at not only your life, but your circumstances, and the world that you look at, it makes all the difference about what lens you look through. And so as a result of that, uh, we said that this is what your world view is. Your world view. What lenses are you looking through to interpret the world, ask questions about the circumstances of our life, and how are we managing uh, these answers? We said that a, a person's worldview, and everyone has one, whether or not we pause to think about it, or logically work its way through coherently, we all have one, and we said that the worldview, your worldview, my worldview, attempts to wrestle with big 
existential questions inside of our life. Where did we come from? What are our origins? What's meaning? That sort of thing inside of our life. What's our destiny? Where are we headed? Albert Moeller said that we ask four fundamental questions inside of our life. We want to know where do we come from? We want to know what's wrong with us. Is there any hope for us? And, and where are we going? And so worldview addresses that. We said that everybody has a worldview, and so we pulled a definition from James Sire's book that's been reprinted multiple times. Uh, He's a Christian author, but has a unique perspective on answering questions about worldview, and said that a worldview, it's kind of this lens. We used that terminology last week. He provides an adequate definition for us about how we see the circumstances and how we try to make sense of the circumstances around us. In addition to that, uh, as we talked a little bit about worldview, we had a quick opportunity to just Uh, illustrate what this would look like inside of our situation as we kind of juxtaposed or we saw how a a worldview would look like a biblical worldview versus a non-biblical worldview. And so we laid them side by side last week just as far as to illustrate that and we said that when we want to go ahead and look at things biblically because the Bible provides a very coherent cohesive worldview that the Bible begins with God in the beginning God God is the creator the, all of humanity struggles with a problem of sin because of that we need a savior and as a result of the savior coming into the world in Jesus Christ he offers to us a way out he offers to us some understanding about our own circumstances he provides salvation we said that the we're created for an eternity and so a biblical worldview would say that heaven is our home because after all God has created the heavens and the earth and the earth is just a place that we're passing through much like a person who's on a camping trip is finished with a tent we said that then because of that and understanding that that we have an image we're image bearers this is God's life that we're living and as a result of that we want to live by God's rules and so we made the statement that when we have these questions inside of our life when we deal with these worldview questions we want to go ahead and ask then what does God have to say to us about these questions and we want to then live into his answers for our life the opposite of that I don't know that you can get that complete opposite, but another way then of approaching life, another way in which people try to make sense of our world and their worldview would be starting without God. And because of the affirmation that there is no God, then there is no need to think about God being a creator or a divine designer as a result of that then there would be no sin inside of the world because there is no absolute morality or absolute truth no need for a savior and as a result of that salvation wouldn't be even a topic that we would consider because there would be really no need for that because there's no God there's no heaven and as a result of that the earth is our home and we just live 70 years and put us in a box and put us you know in the ground and as a result of that it's my life and all about me my mind and my rules and so we kind of made a sweeping generalization then that people make decisions then based upon how they're feeling about a circumstance like that that is a really quick overview of last Sunday and I would like to go ahead and invite you this morning we're going to take a look at the top of that list of a biblical worldview today because our question has to do with aspects of beginnings and has aspects to do Uh, with what's happened inside of our world because we all recognize that the world is not the way it ought to be or the way it should be perhaps even by our own standards whatever that might be and so I want to invite you if you have a Bible this morning I'd like to invite you to turn it to the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis Uh, Genesis is the book of beginnings and it is interesting to me that unless people normally unless people are working through a read the Bible in a year or they're working through some Bible reading plan most of us 
Most of us don't spend a lot of time in the book of Genesis. I think that it's because Many of us are still working out this whole origins question. We're still working out some of the questions that Genesis doesn't even address. And so as a result, we kind of like to turn to the middle or the uh, the New Testament and we want to read about Jesus. But we can't even understand why Jesus comes until we understand the beginning of the book of Genesis. Oftentimes... We don't give thoughtful consideration to some of the things that Genesis wants us to understand. And because of that, we find ourselves trying to make sense of our world looking through a different lens than what the Bible suggests that we look through. And so I want to invite you this morning uh, to look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. I'm not going to read this morning Genesis 1 and 2 because most of our time is going to be spent in a couple of verses in Genesis 3, but I'd like to go ahead and think with you, if I could please, this morning just about some of the things that Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 introduce. In Genesis chapter 1, we find one author, theologian, said we find the godness of God in Genesis 1 and 2. Here we find God before he creates. Here we find God before any circumstances inside the world. Here we find God plus nothing else. We have God who uh, is there at the very beginning of Genesis. And so as a result of that, he is the one who's our creator. He is the one who's complete in and of himself. He is the one who has no problems. There's no rival. There's no competitor. God is God and God alone. Not only do we find the godness of God... We find the goodness of God. Because in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we read the stories about creation and we understand that all he has created, he says, it is good. It is good. That's an extension of his character. It's an extension of his nature. And so as a result of that, we find God in loving community with himself and lovingly creating inside of our world. And so we find here then in Genesis chapter 1 and in chapter 2 an ideal picture, if you will, the ultimate picture of creation. Now, We're going to look at this a bit later on this summer, but you can't understand what our destiny is unless we take a glimpse at what our creation looks like, because it doesn't make any sense. But here we have, in the midst of Genesis chapter 1, a coherent understanding of what God intends. And here is what we find inside of Scripture, in the fact that People who spend some time inside of the Old Testament, they want us to know that here inside of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, we find a world that is, well, the Hebrew word is shalom. It is shalom. Before anything else happens, there is God and His creation, and there is this commingling of individuals and God's creation that is at peace. That is the definition or the ready definition that you might know about shalom. But I want to say to you, it is so much more inside of the biblical understanding. One theologian makes this observation and says that all of the writers inside of the Old Testament look for a day when shalom would happen. And what is shalom? It is all nature would be fruitful and benign filled with wonder upon wonder, all humans would be knit together in brotherhood and in sisterhood, and all humans would look to God and walk with God and lean towards God and delight in God the way it ought to be, is what one guy says. The way it ought to be. And that's what you find in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. You find a clear picture of God's creation who looks to God, who walks with God, who leans towards God, and who delights in God. A webbing together, if you will, of all humans and all creation in justice, in fulfillment, and in delight. Now, 
let me just say to you and remind you that there are some really important dynamics in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that we learn about. The first is that God is in shalom with his creation. And so we recognize that God has a relationship with his creation and there is harmony, there is unity, there is no evil, there is no sin. And so God in chapters 1 and chapters 2 of Genesis has a relational dynamic of love, of intimacy, of community with his creation. Not only does God have that kind of relationship with his creation, the people that he has created have that kind of relationship with one another. As a matter of fact, there's a sense of fellowship. There's a sense of trust that they're made for one another, that they belong together, that together they become one flesh, that there's a perfect equality between man and woman, that there's a harmony, that there's a trust, that there's shalom. Sin is not part of the equation. Evil is not part of the equation. Adam and Eve are at shalom with one another. Adam and Eve are at shalom with God. And then Adam and Eve are at shalom with the world around them, the physical world, the created world. As a matter of fact, God has given them authority and dominion over the created world. And there is shalom, there is peace, there is harmony. Don't miss these three clear dynamics in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. It's the dynamic that is vertical. It's the dynamic that is horizontal between people. And it's the dynamic of people with God's created order and God's created world. And he says this. It is good. It is good. There is no evil. There is no sin. And I want to just highlight this. I want to highlight it because it's critically important that the Bible not only introduces God in this capacity, but then in subsequent verses and in subsequent chapters and stories, the Bible goes on to illustrate that this is the kind of God that we have. That there is no evil inside of God. That's not part of his character and that's not part of his nature. Just as an illustration this morning, let me highlight a couple of verses around that so that we're not confused and we don't uh, go ahead and draw conclusions or make conclusions that aren't represented in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. In Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13, uh, we find the idea that your eyes, speaking of God, they're too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing, says the prophet about God. In the New Testament, 1 John says, in him there is light and there's no darkness at all. When the seraphim inside of Isaiah chapter 6 are singing in the temple, and Isaiah says, they are saying, holy, holy, holy. There's no evil in him. There's no compromise in him. There's no darkness in him. There's no sin in him. James says, God can't even be tempted with evil. He doesn't tempt any person. The psalmist says, you're a God who does not take pleasure in wickedness, neither do you let evil dwell in you. That's clear to understand as far as how this unfolds until we come to chapter 3. The intimacy mentioned inside of this relationship is significant. It's so important that we do know and recognize that not only does God have a relationship with people, they have a relationship of intimacy with one another and then with creation. It's so specific that we see that God comes in the cool of the evening and he walks with his creation. He walks with his creation 
each one of the evenings. And so this implication that God is a God of relationship. He's a God who wants to have an intimate relationship with his creation. And there is shalom. So what happens? What happens? I mean, how does evil get into the world? What happens to God's creation? What happens to Adam and to Eve? I, I think that it's significant and it's important to understand that not only do we have this illustration of what the Bible wants us to understand, but the interesting thing for me is there are only a few verses that illustrate what the problem is. Now in other parts of Genesis, there are stories about people, some of I think Joseph is 12 chapters long inside of Genesis, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm wondering, God is more concerned about the heart of an individual man later on in Genesis than he is telling the story about the fall of the world. Uh, I think that that's what this terminology is used inside of Genesis. If you're familiar with the term the fall or the fall of humanity, that's what we're looking at here in Genesis chapter 3. And our time is running and we do understand that this is more of a survey and a 101 sort of introductory class. Uh, We could spend certainly many, many weeks here, but stay with me as we read this, if we could, the account that Genesis gives. Let's go to the next slide, if we could, and read that the snake was sneakier than any other other of the wild animals, and the Lord God had made. One day, it came to the woman and asked, did God tell you not to eat fruit from any of the tree in the garden? And the woman answered, God said, We could eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden except the one that's in the middle. And he told us not to eat fruit from that tree or don't even touch it or we will die. No, you won't, said the snake. And the snake certainly is representative of Satan, uh, the enemy of our soul, the Bible says, the one who seeks to destroy us. God understands what will happen on the day you eat fruit from the tree. You will see what you have done and you will know the difference between right and wrong just as God does. And the woman stared at the fruit. It looked beautiful and tasty. She wanted wisdom that it could give to her and she ate some of the fruit and then Uh, Her husband was with her and she gave some to him and he ate it too. And at once they saw that they were exposed, that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And then God came in late in the afternoon. He came late in the afternoon when the breeze began to blow and the man and the woman heard the Lord God walking in the garden He'd come just as he always had, but notice their response. They hid themselves. I want to just invite you to think with me this morning that the fall of humanity is introduced in a biblical worldview. It's wrapped up around a relationship. It's wrapped up in the relationship that Adam and Eve have with God. And what takes place is how this interrelatedness changes. What changes? What changes? Now, remember in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 was the narrative about shalom, that Adam and Eve had lived in an open, trusting friendship that was obedient. They had the capacity to be disobedient, but they chose to be obedient in Genesis 1 and 2. What gets exchanged in chapter 3 is now a loving trusting relationship becomes a relationship of distrust, becomes a relationship of distance, it becomes a relationship of suspicion, it becomes a relationship of disobedience. A relationship of trust and communion was exchanged for suspicion and separation. 
Did God really say that? Does he really have my best interest at heart? Can I really trust him with my life? In Genesis 1 and 2, even in the midst of the configuration of the garden, God is at the center. That's where the tree is, at the center. The intention of the writer for Genesis, Moses wants us to know that God has intended for him to be at the very center inside of our lives. When we displace him, we place ourselves in the center. The fall of humanity, according to Genesis, is a fundamental relational decision, an act of the will to place self above God. And so, Tom McCall says inside of his book about sin, that sin is understood as the failure to recognize the authority of God. To exercise our will and what, what we want Versus what God wants. And so years ago, Bill Bright from Campus Crusade, he put together a little sketch pad that helped, actually came from an illustration that he drew on a napkin in a diner that's been reproduced millions of times around the world. And he said it looks something like this. That in Genesis 1 and 2, God is at the center we're on the throne of our lives and self, self is kneeling in adoration and recognizing God's supremacy and God's, God's kingdom, if you will, and we're kneeling in submission and yielding our lives in all things. But in chapter 3 of Genesis, things go horribly wrong. And in a relational decision, Adam and Eve choose to place themselves at the center of their lives, themselves at the center of their lives, and remove God from the picture. It's a remarkable thing to consider that this becomes the entrance for evil inside of the world and you're gonna say Doug come on you can't mean to tell me that you're gonna stand there and tell me that you believe that our world's problems find their origin right here and I will say to you because you can understand this in my time in pastoral ministry I have talked to thousands of people who've said this. I never intended that to happen when I did this. I never thought that it would go that far. I never thought this would happen when I did that. When I compromised myself in this capacity, I never ever dreamed this would happen. I never ever thought, because you see, our decision, when we elevate ourselves to the center of our lives, when we become self-orienting, when we become selfish, when we become self-advertising, we make a mess of our lives and our world is broken. And it, sin always takes us further than we want to go and deeper than we can ever imagine. When we make a rational decision, a willful decision to place ourselves above what God would have for us inside of our world. And so immediately, the relationship and the shalom between Adam and Eve and God, it is fractured. Immediately, the relationship between Adam and Eve is fractured. And monogamy in the Genesis turns into polygamy 
and women become property and used for the advantage of the man. Relationships become fractured and in the next chapter of Genesis, one brother murders another brother and illustrates the depth of the profound darkness that happens in the midst of sin. And you don't have to go very many chapters in Genesis until you come to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, verse 5, it says, All of the world was evil because they placed themselves above the Creator and did what they wanted. The rest of the Bible is a narrative about that exact problem. You get to Isaiah, and Isaiah says this. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We've done our own situations. We've made our own decisions. Ezekiel says, God looked for one person. God looked for just one person. Couldn't find a person who's righteous. Jeremiah said, God was looking for one person who would just tell the truth and could find none. By the time you come to the New Testament, Paul gives an explanation and he says this in in Romans chapter 3. He says, all of us, all of us have been tainted. All of us, the default for all of us is that we would rather be about selfish circumstances, selfish nature, self-centered, self-advertising, all about self, all of us, instead of putting God at the center. And so we need help, the Bible says. Real quickly, stay with me, uh, and I want to just illustrate one more item if I could as we close. It's interesting that you don't ever read the word sin in Genesis 3 verses 1 through 8. That's never there. That kind of makes me scratch my head because the Bible tells the story about sin instead of actually giving it definition. You don't find the definition of sin until a little bit later on in other stories. And there are three words, there's actually more than three words, but let me just give you three real quick that the Old Testament uses for the word sin and it has to do with location and relationship. So here's the easiest one that illustrates exactly what we've been talking about and that is the first word, pana, and it has to do with face. You get the word face from this word in Hebrew. And here's what it means. Well, I play this game with my granddaughter and I do like this, and she puts her face right up close to my face, and we want to look at one another, and we want to bump noses, right, and uh, we want to get close to one another. Do you know where this word here, face, means this? When I take my face and I turn it. When I take my face and I turn it. And relationally, relationally, that's what this word means sin and that makes sense doesn't it because after all if sin is explained in Genesis 3 about the willful decision to move God out of our life and place ourselves at the center that is what we do look and I don't have to tell you that we make these decisions all the time you do it I do it. The other two words have to do with direction. Not relationship, but direction. And they just mean this. Because that's what happened. So what do you do about that? If everybody has this proclivity, if, if the movement inside of our life is to take God from the center and put ourself in the center. What do we do about that? What do we do? Because 
The problem, the fall, Genesis says it's so practical. The fall actually happens because of a singular decision. And I want to tell you the Bible says that the restitution for that lies in a singular decision. By the time you come to the New Testament, the result or how you address the selfish circumstance is to understand that there's not a thing we can do to save ourselves because, look, we're caught. But God has to do something because, look, He's transcended. He's not caught. He's not caught in the circle. That's why Genesis is so important. He can reach down and do something about our situation. And so in a message that Peter gives in the book of Acts, as he's talking about the importance of Jesus Christ and what remedy God has provided, he merely uses language that all of the Old Testament is familiar with. And so in Acts chapter 3, he says this, Here is how we restore God to the center inside of our life. And I want to just illustrate this for you, because this is exactly what the word means. Repent means I am headed in this direction and I turn. It's the reversal, it's the reversal of Genesis chapter 3. Turn. And ask him, hey, Lord, will you come be the center Will you help me be other-oriented instead of self-oriented? Will you help me to love you instead of make decisions against you? Will you help me not only in my vertical relationship, but my horizontal relationships? Can you do that in my life? And so, as we come to the close, I just want to say to you and remind you that the idea of sin inside of our life is not something that is part of our creation. Excuse me, the idea of evil as well, not part of our creation. The idea of sin is that it's an add-on inside of our life. That God had never intended that in the midst of His creation. That evil arrives as an add-on. As a matter of fact, God's intention was righteousness and holiness and shalom. And so as a result of that, when we have an absence of righteousness, we have evil. An absence of shalom, we have evil. An absence of holiness, we have evil. Evil enters into the world because people make volitional decisions to sin. It's not part of God's original creation. All sin leads us and opens the door for evil inside of your world and mine. And it takes us further and deeper than we ever thought we'd go. So what do we do? Be the center, Lord. Come and be the center. So as we close this morning, let me just go ahead and, and take a, a couple of minutes. I know that you've been more than patient and certainly more than generous with your time. But I don't think it would be wise nor prudent for us not to go ahead and close the service and just ask this question. If there's someone here this morning who would like to go ahead and reaffirm their faith and say, I've been sitting as the self upon my throne and I would like to invite God to come and be the centerpiece of my life once again. I want to go ahead and make that decision because you see, here's the thing. The reason he got from being at the center is through a decision. The way he gets to be back to the center is because of a decision that you make. And if you'd like to make a decision like that this morning, I just would merely like to ask you, we're not going to play any songs, we're not going to sing any songs, we're not going to hum anything, uh, we're just going to go ahead and ask you, uh, all around the auditorium, will you just stand up if you want to make that decision this morning? <clears throat> I 
And let's pray together. Lord, will you help us as people who love you to place you at the center of our lives and to continue to order our lives that we would experience the shalom, the abundant love, the way in which you graciously move inside of our life as we order our lives and we make decisions. If it's your life, we want to make God decisions inside of our life. And so thank you for those who are standing this morning. Thank you, Lord, for many who are even just working through this whole information and thinking their way through that. We would pray that you would help us to see through lenses that would consider how we live our lives in relationship and in response to you. And so today, as we close our time together, we would ask that you'll help us. That you have intended us to have a vertical relationship with you and a relationship with the people around us and Many, many of us have messed that up in so many different ways. Come this morning, we would ask. Help us as we place you at the center and invite you to be the one who's in charge of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, Sharptown. Thank you for being here this morning.